I'm Nancy Cool. I'm the curator of Love Jimmy, James Baldwin's Letters to Mary Painter. I'm Cassidy Jones, and I curated Ollie Harrington, Expressing the Revolution. I'm Melissa Barton. I curated Frederick Douglass, Family and Legacy. And the whole exhibit is called Douglas Baldwin Harrington, the collections of Walter O. Evans at Fine Key Library. I just wanted to become more familiar with this material because um, we acquired it uh, during the pandemic and I hadn't had a lot of time to see it. And, and I was very interested in the, this part of the collection has a lot of really amazing kind of high spot items um, and I wanted to kind of understand better how it all fit together. I got to curate the section on Ollie Harrington, which I was excited about mostly because cartoon is a medium I'm not familiar with for thinking through some of these issues which are so familiar. Um, and also because Ollie Harrington was a name I wasn't familiar with. So it felt like a great opportunity to introduce Ollie Harrington and myself. These letters that James Baldwin wrote to his friend Mary Painter offer this really wonderful um, additional view of this writer uh, whose work I think many people um, know and love. I certainly know and love his novels and his essays, um, also his plays. And these letters include uh, lots of the same qualities, lots of the wonderful things that are in those writings. The collection itself includes some hundred letters over a decade. So the exhibition really zeroes in on this eventful year when James Baldwin, who had been uh, living in Paris, returned to the United States for the first time in some years, uh, made his first trip uh, to the American South, um, became an increasingly visible member of uh, the civil rights movement, um, was working on his third novel, Another Country, which is dedicated to Mary Painter, to whom he was writing. So the, his letters document all of those experiences, um, as well as what's going on in his family and his love life and his friendships and um, the many other things that are happening in his life and that are on his mind as an artist and thinker. My part, which is in the curved cases, it's about two dozen cartoons of various sizes, comics of various sizes. Um, there's also a book. There's also uh, a verso and recto of this one image in the center where you get to see part of Ollie Harrington's process because the more finalized version is on the front, but there was a draft on the back that I thought was very interesting. Um, it's cool to see the changes and how he moves the children around in the image. Frederick Douglass' Family and Legacy is in three parts. Um, it's slightly larger than the other two exhibits. And um, the first part really gives some highlights of the Evans Douglas collection, um, really shows kind of some of the areas of concentration, which include like uh, what Douglas's life was like after the Civil War, what he was focused on in that period of his life, um, some of his Haitian consular service, which is near the end of his life, um, an extraordinary group of letters from his son, Louis Douglas, to his to Louis's sweetheart, Amelia Logan. They courted for, I think, 12 years before they were married. The second part of the exhibit includes what is the most kind of noted and significant part of the collection, these scrapbooks that were kept by Louis Douglas, who was Frederick Douglass's oldest son, and Frederick Douglass Jr., who was his middle son. He had three sons. Um, so Louis and Frederick Jr. kept nine scrapbooks kind of covering their father's um, exploits and career. And one of the scrapbooks includes all of the obituaries that were published about Douglas. Um, so those line kind of one side um, in a row of cases, nine scrapbooks in nine cases. Um, and then the final section, thinks about Douglas's legacy and how we remember Douglas and shows some other Douglas material in addition to the Evans collection that is already in the Biden Peace collection that kind of thinks about how people have remembered Douglas over time. Well, when you mentioned Paris, there's the fact that we have these folks who were able to look at the U.S. from an outside context. And I feel like having that distance um, really helped develop a perspective on how America functions, how America interacts with everywhere else, how all of our issues are connected internationally and interpersonally. But also I feel like um, all three of these men had such, they had a really deep understanding about how gaze works. I work in the 19th century mostly, so a lot of what I read uh, 
is depictions of what other people are thinking about black life. Mm -hmm. But all three of these men got a chance to, one, explain black life for themselves and also make it known that we too are watching what's happening and we also have a perspective. Part of my interest in this exhibition um, is the way in which all three of these figures are great artists and their artistry is so inseparable from their uh, commitment to social justice. Mm -hmm. And, um, and those, the, those two things are you know, often quite incompatible, those two commitments. And yet these three figures bring their artistry to all of these complicated, um, the, all the complicated working and thinking they're doing uh, around all those questions you were pointing to. I see so much resonance in the way that all three of these men um, engage with the way that America has an idea of itself, that they're trying to kind of challenge and nuance and, and rethink and, and, and critique. And so, and I see it across, you know, you know, Baldwin and Harrington were pretty much contemporaries, but even with Douglas as well, that all of them were kind of engaging with this idea of um, an, an idea of the United States and what it's about, um, that they are they are trying to kind of poke holes in while they're trying to kind of uphold it at the same time. And I would say too that I think that, you know, I admire Walter Evans and his collecting so much. And I think that he, he collects, you know, across such great breadth. I mean, he has material from the 18th century. He has material from the 21st century in his collection and that we've been able to get these, you know, have these three collections join the collections of Beinecke. Um, you know, they really kind of harmonize so well with the James Weldon Johnson Memorial Collection and, and the kind of interests that we have in African American arts and letters from across, especially the 19th and 20th centuries. I loved the way in which um, working with the two of you helped me see and understand um, Walter Evans' vision as a collector so much more fully. And I think that's a, something that might surprise viewers of the exhibition that they may come in thinking they're gonna learn something about um, Douglas or um, Ollie Harrington or Baldwin and in addition to that, also come away with a kind of sense of what it can mean to um, bring these figures in conversation, bring their, um, their writings and their works together um, in the context of a library like this. I also would say that all four of the men, the figures in the exhibit and Evans, have um, a powerful mastery over their mediums. I think the affective response you get from hearing oration and from reading and from seeing a comic are all very different and yet they were able to drive home very similar points to wide audiences. And then I'm also thinking of collection as a medium more these days. Um, so Walter Evans' impact and contribution to a Black literary tradition, to African Americana as it persists in the 21st century is really significant. Well, we're in a content era I think right now, um, especially with social media, a lot of information is consumed with some sort of visual aspect that's really important, sometimes more important than the message for some folks. Um, so I think Ollie Harrington being able to make use of comics as a, as a way to draw people in is really prescient. Um, and what is the word I'm thinking? <laughs> <laughs> anticipated, anticipated. Uh, the kind of learning that we're doing now. I love letters in literary archives as a genre, um, as a genre of writing. And even though I, I encounter them a lot in my work, it, it often, I'm often um, surprised all over again at how they, they complicate my understanding of a writer. They um, teach me new things about that writer's position um, in the world, but also in their own imagining and in their own thinking. And that was really my experience of these Baldwin letters. I felt quite honored, really, to have this view of Baldwin and his friend, Mary Painter, to whom he's writing, um, at this time in their life when so much is happening in the world around them, their own lives are in transition, as Baldwin, is, who's been in Paris for 10 years, is preparing to um, move away from there. Um, and Mary Painter, who met Baldwin in Paris, had she left um, and had recently moved back to Washington, D.C. when these letters begin. Um, all of those aspects of their lives are part of um, the writing and thinking that's happening in these letters. And it doesn't, um, 
the the work that Baldwin does in these letters, it doesn't, it's not pointed in our direction. It doesn't include me necessarily as its audience. And that um, makes it a, a different kind of view than we can see in published work. Um, Baldwin, during the time that he's traveling, um, writing to Mary, he's also uh, writing several really important um, essays in his career. He's working on this novel that becomes one of his most important works in his in his writing life. And so we see this, this these two views side by side um, existing of Baldwin's experience and his literary craft. You see Douglas as a father, as a parent. You see what it was like for his children to have this lionized figure, even in his own lifetime, as a father, how daunting that was for them. And so that was you know, something that I learned a lot about the family um, while working on this exhibit. And you know, I would never presume to compare myself to Douglas <laughs> and Douglas in any way, except that you know, he had um, five children. There are five siblings. I have four siblings. And so like, you know, I, I have had that experience of having a big family, of having parents who are demanding, you know, and parents who could be demanding and tender and by turns to different kids. And you know, so I think that you can see a lot of that in this correspondence in a way you know, you talk about having these insights into Baldwin's writing life, you know, in the Douglas letters that are in this collection, you see what, how he talks to his children. You, and and my, my favorite piece in the exhibit is this letter that Douglas wrote while he was at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. He's writing to his son, um, Charles, and he asks Charles to store his winter apples from his estate in Washington, D.C for the winter so that he can have some applesauce in the winter. <laughs> and it's just this amazingly like tender, sweet moment when he talks about traveling so much that he doesn't get to enjoy his home. And you know, you kind of, he really humanizes him and you really see this figure who, I mean, there could not be a figure in American history who's more tremendous in a certain way. And you see him as a, a person, as a human. There's a moment in one of Baldwin's letters that I'm reminded of where he, is writing to Mary from Corsica. Um, and he begins with a long passage about how complicated his writing is right at this moment because his cat is um, fascinated by the typewriter keys. <laughs> and so he's trying to write and the cat is leaning into the typewriter. And it's just, it's very much exactly um, the kind of thing you're talking about that uh, figures sometimes when we're reading um, books that we love that um, are just enormously important um, literary works, it can be hard to remember that, you know, someone sat down at a typewriter and made that work um, and in with all the other things that are happening in a person's life. I think that's why I like that central draft image so much. It's a very human moment um, because most of the exhibit is finished products from Harrington. There's not as many intimate moments as I'm sure come up in the Baldwin and the Douglas, but that felt like a very intimate moment between me as a viewer of part of his process and the artist. I really felt daunted um, but uh, by this, but I, I see it as a duty. Um, the Bionic has acquired this extraordinary collection of material that came from Frederick Douglass's hand to give especially the public in New Haven an opportunity to see that material up close and to just have the experience of seeing it. So to me, the work of the exhibit has been how to show as much of it as possible in as coherent a way as possible and to just help interpret it just enough for people to see it. And then the other thing that I have found very daunting, um, that one of the hardest things for me um, in writing the text for this exhibit was how do I introduce Frederick Douglass to someone who has never heard of him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I rare. think so I think between those two things, you know, I'm going to introduce Frederick Douglass to people who have never heard of him and give everybody who has already heard that we've acquired this material a chance to come here and see it as closely as we possibly can for the first time um, to kind of balance those two perspectives in one exhibit. On the one hand, correspondence in archives can be really difficult to get um, a clear view of because we might think that reading someone's letters will be able to um, have a clear view into their mind and really understand what they're thinking about. But letters are, are um, often, you know, the, the collection might have includes some empty envelopes where the letter has been lost, some instances where there are two or three pages of what is obviously a longer letter that those, some pages haven't survived. 
Their letters are full of um, private language, the language of nicknames and uh, secrets that are alluded to partially. So there's a lot, there's quite a lot that is opaque when we're reading other people's correspondence. And we're only reading one side of it in this case. Um, we have only Baldwin's letters to Mary Painter. And so I was eager to try to find a way to make sense of those hundred or so letters um, in a small space and to really let readers see Baldwin's letters and read as many of Baldwin's letters as could be sensibly um, exhibited in the space. So that so I ended up um, with, you know, uh, actually in conversation with Melissa, um, coming in, up to this idea of focusing on that one year, um, which allowed me, 1957, which allowed me in part to keep also this novel, Another Country, that Baldwin was working on through this whole period and that was published a few years later, um, keep that novel at the center so that there's always the letters and what's happening in Baldwin's life and his creative life, his writing life, is happening alongside and is never out of view. Um, and that was important to me and I feel like a, a, an important thing to um, have as part of the context of these letters and this relationship with Mary Painter to whom he dedicated another country. Harrington obviously knew how important graphics can be to any movement, how political graphics can be, but also uh, the role images will play in changing tides, changing minds. Um, so I hope. <laughs> I'm hoping that the people that come see this exhibit um, see that in his work, that he is participating, not just illustrating what's happening around him. Um, like with Aaron Douglas's covers and with um, a lot of the posters that come out of the civil rights movement, the Black Panther Party, all of them, graphics are a part of the strategy. So I think people should think about Harrington's work as part of the strategy of moving away from explicit segregation, that sort of thing, that sort of uh, de facto racism, and um, toward a more equal future that he was hoping for.